virtual entitled Ahora Sí, Will the Latino Youth Both Awaken the Sleeping Giant? So uh, we are going to have an opportunity to discuss if sleeping giant is indeed the right metaphor to describe Latino voters. We will have the chance to understand the complex reasons why Latino population has not massively always aligned with one party or another. If you're watching in our social media, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, please post your questions now. Don't wait until the end. We want to make sure that we collect those questions and we have a chance to answer them. Let me introduce the speakers. Then after very brief introductory remarks, we will have an interview. And at the end, we will uh, be answering your questions. Victoria de Francesco Soto is Assistant Dean for Civic Engagement and a lecturer at the LBGA School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin, where she was selected as one of the UT Game Changers. She's also a faculty affiliate of the Department of Mexican American and Latino Studies and the Center for Mexican American Studies. She received her PhD in political science from Duke University. <clears throat> Christina Sinsun is a civil rights leader former U.S. Senate candidate, author, and community organizer. Christina founded and led two of the Texas largest voting and civil rights organizations, YOLT, a Texas-wide organization focused on energizing the Latino vote, and the Workers' Defense Project, winning the passage of local and state laws protecting the rights of hundreds of thousands of workers. Finally, Raul Madrid is professor in the Department of Government in the National of Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies and the Sector of Mexican American Studies, CIMAS, at the University of Texas in Austin. He specializes in Latino, Latin American politics, imperative ethnic politics, and democratization. And his PhD is from Stanford University. We want to welcome all of you. And let's start with Victoria. Victoria. Gracias, gracias, Paloma, and gracias to Lila Spenson for hosting this tremendous event and for those of you joining. Uh, what I want to do in, in the first couple of minutes is set the stage. I'm a political scientist by training, so I'm going to give some of the broad trends regarding Latino turnout, Latino voting, um, and then this way I think this sets the stage for diving into the current moment, the 2020 elections. So, Latinos are infamous for having the lowest voter turnout, right? Of any of our major electorates, Latinos have lagged behind. This isn't totally surprising from a political science view. We know that folks who have lesser education, lower levels of SES are less likely to participate. They have fewer resources. And if you look at a resource-based model, that kind of explains it. But that's only part of the story when you're looking at Latinos. I think the other important piece of understanding Latinos is that big chunks of our community are immigrant based. Obviously there are Latinos, especially here in the Southwest for whom the border crossed them, but for many Latinos, including you know, my, my familia, my ancestors, they came over into the United States. So the socialization, the political socialization that traditionally comes with other families that are native born isn't as readily seen with Latino families, especially those that are immigrants themselves or second, third generation. So that's part of the process. And the third piece, there are others as well, but the third major piece is not getting mobilized sufficiently. So we know that mobilization, especially for low resource voters, is an especially important piece mobilization in terms of information provision, mobilization in terms of getting folks engaged, letting them know about the candidates, asking them to register, informing them what the registration process is like, what the voting process is like. So those pieces together help us understand why Latinos have not been voting. Over the last 40 years, with one exception, 
two maybe, if you count a half a percentage point, Latinos have not cracked that 50 percentage mark of turnout. Uh, to give you a baseline in the United States, uh, general presidential turnout is about mid 60s, sometimes a little bit higher. Latinos are hovering in the high 40s. And this is really frustrating, and really problematic for those of us who are Latino politics watchers and stakeholders in the community. But, you know, and, and I and I don't say this lightly because I am very cautious. I come at voting trends with with the political science eye. But in 2018, I saw something that shook me and shook me in a, in a positive way. And that is that we saw record turnout, I mean, across the board, but in particular for Latinos. And we know that midterm elections are infamous for lower turnout rates. But in 2018, we saw Latino turnout rates in a midterm election almost rival presidential turnout rates. So in 2018, I think that this is an indication of what is to come. There was a lot of disappointment in 2016. Latinos were not mobilized, and I know we'll be digging into this later. But I think that as a result of frustration, of recognizing that raising your voice is the only option um, in, the, in the current political context, and also some very targeted mobilization efforts, such as by the groups that Cristina is involved with, that we're seeing the Latino giant. I tend to not like that phrase, you know, as a, as a colleague of mine says, it's not that the Latino giant's been sleeping, it's that, you know, we've been too busy working three, four jobs. So the Latino giant has been there, but it's a, it's a cumulative process. And I think that as of 2018, we're seeing something that I'm cautiously optimistic in 2020 is going to continue on. Paloma, we can't hear you. Okay, how about now? Perfect. Thank you, Victoria. We're going to go now to Christina. She will have five minutes for remarks, and then we will start the interview. Christina? Great. Thanks so much, Paloma. And Victoria, thank you for your words and work um, that have really uplifted our community and gotten us much greater respect um, that we deserve. So I wanted to start off actually thinking about 2016. And I liken 2016 to uh, our political 9-11. I think everyone will remember exactly where they were and what they felt on election night 2016. Um, for me, I remember I was six months pregnant and I just was in shock. And I felt such fear, a fear I had never felt uh, before because I felt like my entire family and community future, our safety was on the line. I was six months pregnant with my first child. Um, and my partner um, is a dreamer. And we hadn't been able to fix his documentation at that point. And so for us, it really came home that our family could be ripped apart by the policies that the Trump administration was putting forth and how they would attack the undocumented in our community. Um, and so I spent, I think, the first three or four days just crying in bed. And you know, as scary as it was to have a new child and face what was going to happen to our country, I got out of bed and I organized this rally. I had already decided I was going to launch Jolt, and I named it Jolt because I knew that if young Latinos came out and voted, we could be a shock to the political system, not just of Texas, and the but the entire country. That was the power that we held in our hands. And so I got out of bed and I said, well, the only thing I know how to do when I'm this afraid is organize. And so I organized a rally, not that maybe a couple hundred people will show up. And it was 2000 people that showed up. And it was from there that I knew that even though as afraid as I felt to launch a whole new organization when I wasn't ready to do so and I was six months pregnant, it was more fearful to imagine sitting on the sidelines during a Trump administration and doing nothing. And I think as Latinos, we've already built so much power in a short time period. We are underinvested in 
consistently. Um, I think that's why we have lower voter turnout. But I also think we are a population, you know, Victoria mentioned, we have many people who are foreign born, like my mother that took 30 years to become a US citizen. But we also, our voting power lies with young voters. Half of the people turning 18 in this state are Latino and 95% of them are eligible to vote. That is the power that people in charge fear. Um, that those numbers, but demographics are not destiny. It requires organizing investment. And I believe pushing both political parties to answer to the needs of our community. Because as the Latino community here in Texas, even though we make up 40% of the state's population, we are the least likely to graduate college, the most likely to be poor, the most likely to die on the job. Every major indicator about our health and well being, we almost rank dead last. And that isn't because we don't work hard. That's because we don't have the resources and the representation that we deserve. And so I want to remind us that not only do Latinos have the power to flip the state, but we have the power to determine an entire new direction for our country. But that real change isn't about going from red to blue. It's about des delivering real change to our community so that we have the health and well-being that all people deserve. The last thing I want to say is, you know, I know folks know that I was uh, ran for Senate, um, came in third. And part of the reason I ran is because I wanted to make sure that there was going to be a formidable Latino candidate in the race. Um, and also the idea that I, someone who had not run for office, just to understand how powerful our community is, that someone like me running that wasn't independently wealthy, uh, that was raising a, a, a toddler um, that, again, hadn't held elected office, I was able to do that because of the work I had done at JOLT, that the work of organizing young Latinos had won so much respect and power that we were able to flex, that people wanted to see that um, kind of leadership dem demonstrated in the Senate because I was recruited to run. So I want us to understand that that power and me running came from the power of young Latino voters. And I think that today a lot of Latinos in our, in our community live afraid of what politicians will do to us. But I want politicians to live afraid of what we will do to them with the power of our vote, because that is the power that we have. And we are starting to exercise it. But um, the greater numbers that we can pull out, the, the greater we can change the dynamic of fear from our community and shift that into power and courage and change. Thank you very much. We're going to now bring to the screen Professor Raul Madrid, who's going to interview him. So. Hello. Uh, so it is a pleasure to be here with both of you. Thank you both for those uh, really interesting and enlightening uh, statements about the Latino vote. And, uh, uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to our discussion tonight. Uh, so let me start off by saying um, it sounds like both of you really expect a high Latino turnout this year. Um, and so I guess I, 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 if I could ask you to venture a guess, are we going to get over 50%? Um, is it possible to get over 60%? And in particular, what impact do you think mail-in voting is going to have on Latinos. And why don't we start with you, Victoria? There we go. I'm unmuted. Uh, gracias, Raul. Good to see you. Uh, all right. So if, if I were a betting woman, which I'm not, we are going to cross the 50% threshold. Uh, I, I'm not going to wager any money exactly on what the range is. Uh, let's say a safe mid 50s, right? That buys me a couple percentage points. Uh, but, you know, so I, I, again, Rome was not built in a day. And while I do see positive trends among the Latino electorate, it takes time. And, and I think this ties in also to your question about mail-in ballots because I'm worried. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be totally honest with you. I'm worried because, you know, for those of us who are, quote, unquote, politically sophisticated, I've never voted by mail. I really don't know what it's like. And every state has a different vote by mail system. Some, some states are more permissive, Texas isn't. 
And so there's a different process, a signature there, a signature here, postmark by then, drop it off here, mail it in there. So just the, 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 the logistics of it could lead to ballots being rejected. And in 2018, there was a study conducted looking at the, the profile of the rejected ballots in Florida and in Georgia. And the study found that the higher percentage of rejected ballots were of young people and people of color. So again, these are our, our folks in our population who tend to be lower SES, you know, less familiarity with the political system. So I, I mean, vote by mail, I think is just, especially if you haven't done it, if you're not in a state that's used to doing it, it, it is going to take a lot of kind of logistical training on the part of the voters and the election officials. And then you layer on top of that, that for many Latinos, this is going to be one of their first elections ever, or perhaps they hadn't voted in a long time. So just that fact makes me nervous. And I'm not even getting into the whole post office thing and, and, and whatnot. So I'll, I'll leave it at that with me feeling a little bit nervous. Christina, what are your thoughts on this issue? Well, I think we've seen tremendous growth in the Latino electorate, especially here in Texas. You know, one of the things that I think is important to understand is just when we talk about Latino turnout is also about investment from parties and candidates. You know, in 2016, when Trump was on the ballot and had said terrible things about Mexicans and Latinos, 60% of eligible voters, according to Latino decision, were never contacted to vote by mm -hmm. any candidate. So I lay the blame squarely on the campaigns and parties that don't invest in our community because Latinos will tell you the number one reason they don't vote is because they don't know who the candidates are and no one contacts them. So therein lies a cyclical problem. But I think that this is starting to change. I think people, we are now the largest non-white voting bloc in the United States um, and people are starting to invest. I think we need to be more loud, um, more stern about the investment we want to see from parties and candidates, um, because I think that that is where the real resources lie. There are organizations like mine, Jolt, Move Texas, Texas Freedom Network that has been investing in and top that's been investing in the power of the Latino vote, especially the youth vote. But the resources you need in a state where, for example, there are 11 million Latinos and millions of eligible Latino voters, we need the resources that it only a campaign or a candidate can bring. I am concerned about mail-in ballot. I'm also concerned that it wasn't extended to every single American, especially here in Texas. Again, most of our voting power lies with the, the age bracket under 40. And none of us are eligible to vote unless we have some uh, uh, health circumstances that the, the Texas Secretary of State has said we would be allowed to vote. And that's why you had organizations like LULAC sue the state of Texas because it is actually discriminatory against uh, voters of color. Um, I completely agree because here in Texas, or not Texas, but nationally, the most common age amongst white folks is age 55. The most common age amongst African Americans is 27 in the United States. For Latinos, it's 11. Um, so, you know, to me, it's, it's about, yes, vote by mail, how our community turns out, but all of the tools and tactics that come from long line to trying to purge 100,000 naturalized citizens from voting and the fear that it creates in our community to making it difficult as possible to vote, that democracy doesn't die in one false swoop, it dies a thousand cuts. And that's what they're trying to do to our community. All of our community is overcoming this and fighting back and going to vote. And I think actually the assaults and attacks have made people so angry that they are overcoming all of those obstacles because that I see is how people are trying to maintain power is to create obstacles and roadblocks for Latino and African American voters. Thank you. Uh, so that brings me to my next question, which is really about Latino youth. Uh, so, what can we do to boost that? the turnout of Latino youth. I mean, this is obviously a key constituency. Uh, the Latino population, Latina population in this country is quite young on the whole. And so if there is a sleeping giant, and I agree, I'm not terribly fond of that term, but if there is a sleeping giant, it's certainly the Latino youth. So what, what can we do to boost turnout among this key demographic? 
You can start with Victoria, yeah. Right, so I, I'm, I'm gonna toss this one to Christine. I'll say just a couple of words, but she's been on the ground, really rolling up her sleeves and, and, and working on Latino uh, youth turnout mobilization. But, you know, just kind of a context in terms of data, young people, black, white, brown, Asian American, indigenous, they are infamous for not turning out to vote. I mean, young people just have better things to do, I guess. So, so this is just a, a truism about young folks, but it hits us really hard in the Latino community because as Christina was saying, you know, the average age of Latinos is 11. The average age of Latino um, electors is, you know, 20 something. So this hits us really hard. The key is, like with all voting, but in particular Latinos, is micro-targeting. For a long time, campaigns thought that they could just kind of take the message they had and then kind of, you know, show it on the, the hours that young people were watching TV, or they did that with Latinos. They would take, you know, one kind of mainstream message and pump it over into Spanish language with a Google translation. If you want to connect with voters, you need to meet them where they are. You don't want to talk about taxes. You don't want to talk about Medicare. You don't want to talk about Social Security. Not that these issues are not important. They're very important, but they're the type of stuff that you and I care a little bit more about. We're a little bit older. But for, for youth who are in their late teens, early 20s, that doesn't hit home as much as, say, student debt. Uh, with regards to DACA recipients, or you know, immigrants who are mixed status, they have family members that are undocumented, but they themselves can vote. Immigration is something that connects with them. So understanding that the youth do take an extra boost of mobilization because you know they, they are not in the habit of turning out and they're young, and also finding the issues that truly connect them. So I think for Latinos, the question of the power of the youth vote is so critical because again, that's where all most of our power lies. So I I think about how we shift the culture, not just with the Latino community, but at a systemic level in our country around the issue of democracy and voting. Because this is becoming an issue that's not just within our community, it's amongst others. And there are things that we can do that will help the Latino vote, that will also help the American vote, because I believe democracy is strong when we have candidates that win with a mandate, a majority of voter participation, instead of a minority of voter participation. People in power, for example, in Texas, have long enjoyed winning with a minority of voter participation, because as a state, we have also ranked one of the lowest in voter turnout. So as the Latino vote is going up, the state's um, voter turnout is going up. So one, we need to make sure that we're making voting as easily as easy as possible. Um, right now, we have people who are trying to limit participation. To have great participation, we need candidates that can win on the merit of their ideas. That means people need to be able to vote easily. So one, I don't, other states, you don't even have to register to vote. If you're an American citizen, it is your right to vote and you are able to vote. You don't have to register beforehand. There's automatic voter registration in those states. That's something that we need to bring to Texas. Um, we also need to make sure that people are doing full information on um, bilingual about how to vote, when to vote, um, making sure we uh, reinstate the core components of the Voting Rights Act that were vetted that protected the rights of Latino voters. And then you do need as you said, candidates and parties that speak to the Latino vote. We need to invest in our community, but we also need to speak deeply to our issues. You know, I think one way you can see is that it's also about investment. You know, I get one of my favorite myths about the Latino vote is that we are actually a conservative voting bloc, even though the majority of Latinos, especially younger Latino voters, vote Democratic. Now, the Latino vote was carried in the Democratic primary by Bernie Sanders. And it was carried, one, because he had an issue agenda that spoke to the key issues, especially young Latinos care very deeply about, raising the minimum wage, uh, treating immigrants with respect, um, health care for all, of course, because he had the highest uninsured rate. And because he put his money where his mouth is, he spent more money than any other candidate on the Latino vote. We are a community, honestly, that is up for grabs. We are lean democratic, but we are up to grab. The question is, who's going to invest in us first? Like, if you ever invest in us first, 
actually is who wins us in long term. I see right now the most progressive side of the Democratic Party investing the most in the Latino vote, and that could have long term implications for our community. Um, the last thing I would say is Latinos, many in our community work two jobs uh, or three jobs. I believe that we should make election day a national federal holiday and require that employers pay people to have that time off to be able to go vote. I think that that would substantially increase participation because to me there is no greater holiday or way to celebrate our country than through uh, a national federal holiday for election day so that every single American can have the time to go vote. That's a very good idea. Um, so, so that brings me to my next question, which is really about how Latinos are going to vote in this election. So there's been some news stories recently about how Trump is polling better among Latinos than you might expect, given his anti-immigrant policies, his anti-immigrant rhetoric, his specifically anti-Mexican and anti-Latino uh, rhetoric. So I guess my question to both of you is, how well do you think Trump is going to do among Latinos? And what explains this? Why, why would some Latinos vote for Trump? And why don't we start off with Christina this time? So I would say a couple things. One is that I think that there has been, especially in key states like Florida, real investment from Republicans to divide and break up the Latino vote. Um, and I think that that investment will be a payoff for Republicans in, in Florida. I don't know whether Trump will win Florida or not, but I think you will see real numbers uh, that go towards uh, the Trump administration. In places like Texas and Arizona, I think the vote will be overwhelmingly for Joe Biden. Um, again, a more uh, Mexican uh, background and ethnic group in Texas, 85% of the Latino population is of Mexican descent, another 10% Central American, and then a 3% uh, uh, or 3 to 5% mix from other areas, from other national origins. I also want to say that I think Democrats do two things. They don't invest in our community and they take us for granted. And we don't turn out in the way that we could because of that lack of investment. I feel like this is one of the real myths about our community. Um, I posted something the other week that, you know, Texas is flipping and we make up 40% of the state's population. I am so glad that Victoria gets interviewed on MSNBC, but so many times people talk about Texas flipping and there is no Latino voice present in a state where we make up 40% of the population. Um, and it depends so much on our power and vote. And I had a lot of people respond, well, most Latinos vote Republican or for Trump. The data does not show that, but many people think that. Now there is a minority of our population that does vote Republican. Um, there's a portion that we will never shift to vote any other way. That's the way they're gonna vote. Um, the greater area is expansion into the youth vote that is very progressive, very pro protecting the rights of immigrants, very pro protecting the rights of the Black Lives Matter movement, very pro protecting the rights of the LGBTQ community, and also has a real vision around economic justice. So I, I get tired of the idea that when people say, oh, Latinos, they vote so Republican. Um, the data doesn't support that. Um, and to me, it's a comparison, an unfair comparison. Um, it's interesting when I think about the white vote that majority voted for Trump. Um, rarely do you hear white folks compared as just solid Republican voters in the same way, um, even though the majority of our population is voting Democratic. They compare us to the African American vote when uh, I think that those comparisons don't necessarily make uh, total sense. Again, the vote will continue to be roughly 30% will vote probably for Trump. Um, is my guess. Um, and some of that will come down to lack of investment in the Latino vote. And then there's a portion that we can never move. And that's okay uh, for me as a progressive. The vast majority will vote for progressives and on progressive issues. And there are millions more Latinos to go mobilize. People aren't just, people just aren't investing in our community. So I, I agree. My, my hunch is also it's going to be in that 30 percentage 
range. Um, and, and I think to understand this, because I get this question all of the time, I think, first of all, is understanding the diversity of the Latino community. And in particular, understanding that Cuban bloc that came over post uh, Castro, post Cuban revolution, and understanding that for many reasons, foreign policy reasons, you know, not to get into here, but that is a reliable Republican bloc. Uh, he's probably Trump, President Trump is probably going to get upwards of 45% of the Cuban vote in Florida and then in the aggregate high 30s. And then when we look at other groups, right, so the big three are Mexican-American, Cuban-American, and Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans, like Mexicans, um, tend to overwhelmingly vote for the Democratic Party. However, in Texas, like the state in general, it's at least until now, it's leaned a little bit more conservative. Even Democrats sometimes, up until recently, have leaned a little bit more conservative. You're blue dog Democrat. So in Texas, Texas was the exception when it came to non-Cuban Florida Latinos. So Texas always had a couple more percentage points of Hispanic Republicans than, say, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico. So Texas was always the exception. Texas has always hovered around that 30%, and that's essentially what we're seeing in the polls. So it's understanding that there is this variance based on country of origin, and country of origin is also shorthand for why did you come here? Did you come here for economic purposes, or did you come here for foreign policy purposes? Um, there's also something to be said for pre-Trump, um, having that kind of Reagan-esque Bush view, the compassionate conservatism, which was very strong in Texas during the 90s, that was a big pull for Latinos as well. We also know there's the Chamber of Commerce pull, right? The, the, the small business folks. And for some Latinos who are very fervently Catholic and very pro-life, that's a pull as well. So, you know, people always say, well, why, why, why are they voting Republican? Why? There's many reasons. It depends on the person, but but those are the biggies. And you know, the other one is Latinos vote for Trump for the same reason that black and white folks do, right? They, they like him, there's something about him, they like his bluster. Um, I also have always argued that there's a sense of aspirational identity in voting for Trump. Uh, I mean, you know, especially someone who's working class, what is voting for a Republican ticket gonna get you? Like, oh, lower taxes? Uh, but so I think it's this combination of factors of why Latinos are going to vote for Trump. And finally, coming back to the issue of mobilization that I talked about earlier and that Christina just touched on, you know what? Trump's been putting in the work. And it's really been remarkable in comparison to 2016, because in 2016, the Trump campaign wrote off Latinos. You know, in, in the modern era of campaigns over the last 20 to 30 years, Every presidential campaign has had a targeted Latino outreach. They've had a Latino page, even if it was like horribly translated and cut and paste, they had it. Trump didn't, which was quite interesting. But this year he does. He has a shiny Latinos for Trump, not too substantive, but it's there. Uh, and he has maintained that contact, most targeted in Florida, but also making inroads here in the Southwest. And finally, I, you know, over the summer, we saw the, the, the Goya boycott, right? The, the, the CEO of Goya, one of the main folks from Goya was at the White House and we saw a Twitter campaign to boycott Goya. But if you look beneath that kind of outrage of a, a, a beloved popular brand that us Latinos go to, that is closely associated with Trump, is Goya was visiting the White House during the summer when President Trump put forward a series of executive orders on Hispanic prosperity. Their executive orders are a little bit more ceremonial. They didn't have much substance or teeth to them in terms of implementation, but that sent a very clear signal to those Latinos in the conservative area, in the business area of saying, I'm speaking to you, I'm trying to cultivate your vote, you know, I'm doing stuff. Another piece here is in Florida, you know, Biden was two to three weeks late in getting up in the air before, you know, after after Trump did. So, you know, we don't pay that much attention, but Trump and his campaign has been putting in the work for those micro-targeted sectors that they know that they can pull off. They know that there are some that they just can't, but all those kind of biggies put together help, you know, when, when I'm asked, 
what is it that, that brings Latinos to vote for Trump? There's no silver bullet, but it's a combination of all of those. Thank you. So what do you think are going to be the key issues for Latino voters in this election? What do you think is going to motivate them in terms of vote turning out and in terms of deciding who they are going to vote for? Why don't we start with uh, Christina? Well, I think you're going to see some of the core issues that Latinos have reported that they care about deeply. So especially once you talk about the younger Latino vote, but I think we first have to talk about the impacts of COVID-19 that have been totally devastating for the Latino community. So many in our community are essential workers that didn't have the choice to stay home. Um, many of who were forced back to work, including in slaughterhouses by President Trump, where people were then exposed, got sick and died. Um, there is both the healthcare crisis we face around COVID-19 as a community and, and the disproportionate impact um, as a community that was already uh, the, the ethnic group that was least likely to be insured in the entire country um, and the economic implications of a community that was already living on the edge and so many have really fallen off of that cliff. So I think that you're going to have people voting um, out of desperation on the economic issues and wanting um, deep economic support. Um, I think this is an opportunity actually where Latinos have to continue to push um, Democrats. I think it's hard to push Republicans on this issue, but the fact that um, hundreds of thousands of people in our community were left out of getting any stimulus support because they had an undocumented family member. Um, and here in Texas, some estimates show that even 30% of Latino households may have not gotten uh, a check, uh, a stimulus check, which was wholly inadequate, but was something um, for thousands and thousands of people. So I think you're going to see people voting on those two core issues. And then the issue of immigration. Um, here in Texas, half of all those under the age of 30 that are Latino have one parent that is foreign born. So we are a community that is very tied to the immigrant experience, even for people like me that I was born here, but my mother is from Mexico. I feel very deeply the attacks over the last four years against the immigrant community, against the Mexican community, I feel proud. And this is what I see from a lot of young people, pride to go vote for our families, our community in defense and honoring all of the sacrifices that our parents have made for us. And so I think you will see people voting on that issue, driving them to the polls um, to really cast a ballot for our families, our community, and to end the politics of hate. So I'm just gonna underscore COVID. Uh, COVID has affected everyone in this country, but it is especially affected our minority communities. And if I can dig a little bit deeper, it's especially affected Latinas. So Latinas have the dubious honor of having the highest unemployment rate as a result of COVID-19. Why? Well, because we're overrepresented in the low wage, low skill industry. You know, we're the ones who are working in your restaurants. We're the ones who are cleaning your hotel rooms. We're the ones who are working in the casinos. So all these places where there's a lot of social interaction and COVID shut all of that down. So that's, that's part of it. But I also, you know, kind of in, in, in peeking to the future, I worry a lot because these are jobs that are, we're on the brink of becoming automated, right? So we're in this fourth industrial revolution and it, it, you, you see it, right? When you go to the restaurant, a lot of times it's self-service. You go and pick up your own food and you check out yourself. You don't necessarily have that service component anymore. So for these women who lost their jobs, they're not necessarily going back to the way things work. And then add on top of that, the fact that we've lost childcare. So I think COVID-19 envelops everything. I think the response to the pandemic speaks to most directly healthcare and you know one's survival and livelihood, but also jobs, also schooling and education and childcare, and finally job training, because we need to give Latinas and women in general the tools to thrive in the economy and the way things are now, we've always gotten the short end of the stick as women as in as, uh, communities of color. And so that if we were to, were to at a crossroads 
And so if something does not systemically change, we're going to spiral down. The silver lining is we have the potential to enact some much needed institutional change that will help us reimagine and give us the tools to thrive, not just as communities of color, but as a society in general. So I think that COVID-19 in every single possible way permeates the 2020 election. So we haven't talked yet about the issue of abortion. Um, so clearly we have a, a nominee for the Supreme Court now, Amy Coney Barrett, who by all accounts is, is pro-life and it's quite possible that she will provide uh, the votes on the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, do you think, is it likely that the issue of abortion is going to sway Latino voters at all in this election? Um, why don't we start with you, Victoria? So I think that for, for voters for whom um, abortion is, is a main issue, that they were already there. I think that for, I mean, and, and, and look at the public opinion data, right? The majority of Americans support a woman's right to choose. Um, and, and, you know, and then you have shades of that, you know, to save a mother's life and whatnot. Few Americans are staunchly, you know, pro-life, no exception. So I think it's if you're already predisposed to vote um, a pro-life ticket, to vote for the Republican Party because of that one issue, I think that the nomination of Coney Barrett maybe might mobilize you to vote in case you were thinking of staying home and you weren't too sure. But I don't really see it as a persuasive tool. Perhaps mobilization, but not that much. Can you hear Christina? Oh, now I can. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, do you think abortion is going to play much of a role in this election, at least among Latino voters? So, um, you know, when I started, Joel, I think the, the most common question, I would get two common questions. Um, one was first, Latinos are so conservative. <laughs> um, they don't actually vote uh, and they don't want to vote um, for progressive candidates because Jolt was explicitly progressive. Um, and the data just doesn't support that, even on the issue of abortion. There is a core group of our, in our community that this is their most important issue and they vote around. But the data also shows that Latinos that care deeply and it's their number one issue doesn't track any more than for white Americans. In fact, um, the people that care very deeply about this issue and uh, the Caucasian community, and this is their number one issue, it tracks the same roughly for Latinos and white folks. Um, there is a huge component of our community that is Catholic, that is faith-based and how they make decisions. But when you come especially to younger voters, uh, in 2018, Jolt did one of the most comprehensive studies on younger Latino voters and trends. And we asked them about the issue of abortion. Would a candidate being pro-choice um, prohibit you from voting for them? Or would a candidate um, that said they were uh, they would restrict abortion um, or were against abortion, would that prohibit you from voting for them? They actually tracked the same, and it was very small. It was like 7 to 9% of those respondents out of 1,200 people surveyed said that that would stop them for or against. It was, you know, it was negligible. Um, what the important thing is that roughly this is not the most important issue for Latinos. The most important issues are economy, healthcare, and immigration. Those are the most important issues. And so that's what candidates need to be speaking to um, because that's actually where the needs of our community deeply are. And Latinos, again, we track the same against whites and African-Americans about how we want to protect and believe we should make it a woman's right to choose. It's roughly the same. So I think this is an unfair myth that gets placed on our community that maybe was true 20 or 30 years ago, but really is not accurate today. Thank you. Uh, so, so the issue of the immigration, um, I think many of us expected in the 2016 election uh, that this issue would really hurt uh, Trump among Latinos because Trump obviously has uh, used such anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric. Uh, and the fact that Trump, you know, got in the uh, election 30% or so, you know, the fact that the percentage of Latinos who voted for Trump wasn't that different from in previous elections with Republican candidates, I think surprised many of us. 
Um, so I guess my question is, um, one, do you think immigration is going to be a big issue uh, uh, among Latinos in this election? Uh, it seems to have died down a bit in terms of, uh, because obviously with the pandemic and all, there's less immigration period where many people are focused on other issues. So do you think immigration is going to play a big role um, in this election? Uh, and if so, why? Uh, why don't we start with you, Christina? So I think it is a top issue for many, many Latinos. One thing we have to understand is, you know, this is why I, I, I personally am against the electoral college, because it also means that then candidates and parties don't invest in communities that live in key states that are not considered swing states. So one in five Latinos in the United States live here in Texas. We in the 2016 election were not considered a swing state. I know of a Latino candidate or a Latino donor, uh, very wealthy in the state that offered uh, the Clinton campaign, a million dollars to do ads for Latino voters, but only if they would spend it in Texas. They refused those resources because they didn't see Texas in play. So um, that's part of the issue that we see. Um, I also, here in Texas, and why I think it's so important that people invest in Texas and the Latino community and in other key states like Arizona, is I, the only polling I trust on the Latino vote actually comes from Latino decisions. Um, because if you see a lot of polls, for example, that come out of CNN or MSNBC, they don't do the percentage that they should of monolingual Spanish speakers. Monolingual Spanish speakers tend to vote more for Democrats. So in Latino decisions is the only one that will match the percentages in states of the monolingual population. Others, they'll just go for the English speakers, which switch, which, you know, is not then accurate. So in 2016 in Texas, Latino decisions said that 82% of Latinos reported that they voted for Hillary Clinton. Well, CNN's polls had it at like 60 something or 72 or, you know, it was just, it was 10 percentage points off. And you'll see that consistently with Latino decisions polls versus news entities that poll the Latino community. I personally don't think that they're accurate on our community. Um, I think immigration is a huge driving issue, especially for younger Latino voters. Um, because so many of us, even though we are born in this country, and there are many that are fifth generation in our community, but so many of us, especially in the younger demographic, have a parent that is foreign born, and it deeply offends us to see our community and all of the sacrifices of our parents come under attack. The last thing I'll say is so many people in the Latino community also didn't believe that someone like Donald Trump could win in 2016. I fought with my mother for a week to go vote for Hillary Clinton because she said, Hillary's just going to win anyway. I don't really want to go vote. And I said, I am pregnant <laughs> with a child whose father is undocumented. You want me to tell Santi that if Trump wins, you didn't go cast your ballot against a man that wants to take his father away? And that got my mother to go vote. But there are many people in our community, like many other Americans, that simply did not believe that Trump could win, win, and my mother's number one issue is always immigration. Victoria? Right, so I, I think in 2016, there, there was a belief by many that Hillary Clinton was gonna win, even though she technically won the popular vote, but that she was just going to win the White House. I also think that folks thought that Trump wouldn't be that bad on immigration, that it was, just Trump being his TV apprentice personality, but that once he got into office, he would he would do things, you know, more like his predecessors and, and, and tone it down. We, we saw that that wasn't the case. So, you know, immigration is a top issue, but again, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna back up to signal here. The economy and healthcare, these are the biggies in general, and immigration is an important one there, but especially in this moment of COVID, when we've been hit by this recession, it is extremely important. And in addition to that, because of the pandemic, the focus on immigration by part of the Trump administration in terms of being very vocal about it has been toned down. So as opposed to where we were four years ago today, where immigration was the main topic at all of the rallies, it was the main topic, of campaign debates is it's really, I mean, the first presidential debate, the little that you could probably make out of that debate, 
There was nothing about immigration. There is nothing in the vice presidential immigration, uh, vice presidential debate. So immigration has, has left the limelight. So I think that's a reason why it's still in the ecosystem of top issues for Latinos, but not to the same degree. And really, really quickly, lastly here, Raul, I do want to highlight that although immigration has been out of the headlines, we haven't seen the Trump administration talking about immigration. The Trump administration has been hard at work on immigration during this whole time, right? So during the time of the pandemic, if anything, the Trump administration that has a very hardcore immigration restrictionist agenda uh, has been chipping away at legal immigration, has been working on the regulatory process of rulemaking when it comes to immigration and constricting in that sense. So, you know, let's let's not be fooled about the issue of immigration. It hasn't suddenly kind of been ignored, thankfully. Um, it's still at work. And I think this is something that people in the community, those of us here, know, but maybe the general American public does not necessarily know. I think that's very true. And, it, and sometimes a lot more damage can be done when people aren't paying attention. That is when uh, the administration is allowed to do um, as it pleases. Um, so another question I have is about the, um, the absence of Latino or Latina candidates at the top of the ticket now. So we see that in Texas, um, both in terms of the presidential, vice presidential, gubernatorial, you know, having a government race here, but Senate uh, race, uh, and in some other states, as well, in most other states as well, we don't see Latinos or Latinas at the top of the ticket. Um, do you think uh, that will make a difference? Um, why don't we start with you, Victoria? So having someone that looks like you or has a similar sounding last name like you helps, right? So in, in terms of mobilization, we want to have that top of the ticket to help folks. As it's not direct mobilization, obviously, but an indirect mobilization piece. But it's a catch-22, right? Because until we show our, our higher numbers of turnout, you know, the, the very tippy top of the ticket isn't going to consider us necessarily for a vice presidential pick. Or the, the political powers in different states aren't going to look to have the front runner or have the the, the hand-picked choice for a Senate seat, be a Latino or a Latina. I do see changes, you know, in, in, in California, the state with the most Latinos, we are seeing some changes, but, you know, I would love to see um, a Latino, you know, being put in place in Kamala Harris's seat when she goes up or when Feinstein, that, that would be my hope. Um, same here in, in Texas. I mean, there's nothing that I would have loved more to see Christina on that ticket and then going to Washington, D.C. I am cautiously optimistic that I do think it is soon coming, but it's it's on us. It's on the Latino electorate. Once we crack that 50% threshold, once we can see that Latino muscle flex, that's when talented Latino candidates will be able to more forcefully make a stand. So for me, I think a lot about, you know, the, I'm a progressive, I've always voted for progressive candidates. Um, I don't find a political home in the Republican Party, but I also find flaws and failures in the Democratic Party, especially when it comes to representation of diverse communities and the issues that impact our community. Um, for me, it's been critical. I've always said I would vote for the candidate that I thought had the best policies and solutions for my community. You know, I think Jolt made a big stir in 2018 because we didn't endorse uh, Lupe Valdez that was running for governor at the time um, because our, our young members didn't feel like she was strong enough on immigration for them, which was their one of their key issues. But I also think representation matters deeply because I think representation and lived experience often leads you to different policy outcomes um, and that that's critical for our community. My real fear is that as Texas changes politically, we will see in our elected officials our community. 
um, that we won't see our issues come to the forefront, that we will see black and brown voters taken for granted. And I talk, I'll tell a little story about the Senate race. So it's no surprise I was not uh, Chuck Schumer's choice to run for Senate. Um, I was the progressive candidate that was asked to run by progressives in the state and also folks that were concerned about the issue of representation. And when I went and met with some folks at the Democratic Senate Committee, I said, look, in 2018, Beto uh, did not win the Latino vote as he should have in the primary, the Democratic primary. And that was because our community is hungry and desperate for representation. You can't just ask for our votes and not have our voices present as well. That if this state really wants to change, it also depends on our voices and our issues being in leadership. Um, I worry that we will be taken for granted, that we will be slighted, um, and that that also hinges on us winning uh, and strengthening our democracy. And so I, I, I turned to them and I said, my concern, if you try and handpick a candidate in a state where we make up 40% of the state's population, you will be sending a message to the Latino vote that you do not respect us, that you do not want to invest in us, and that you do not want us in leadership. I would hate for that ultimately to backfire on your chosen candidate. Um, so please let Texans decide who should be their candidate. So um, for me, this issue is very critical. You know, Victoria brought up California that is changing, but still there has not been a state senator. Um, a U.S. senator that is Latino in a state where Latinos make up the largest uh, non-white group in the state. The they are now the largest ethnic group in California. They do have never had a governor that is Latino in that state. So we have been the ones that shifted to California so deeply from a red state to a blue state, yet we have lacked leadership in that state. I don't want to see that happen here in Texas. Uh, so let me now take some questions from the audience. Um, here we have one from Guillermo Narvaez, who asks, um, how can we keep the momentum in our community for these next couple of weeks? Uh, and then he goes on to ask, why are Latino men lagging in response to uh, Latinas in terms of their willingness to go to vote? Uh, why don't we start with uh, Victoria? Guillermo, I'm guessing that you're having your students read um, Chris Cepeda Milan's book of the uh, 2006 mobilization. Great read, by the way. I, I had him. Uh, I had my students read the book as well. Uh, in terms of, of what to do to keep folks energized in these literally next two weeks, I, I like I'm saying it out loud and I can't believe it that election day uh, is officially in two weeks. I think it is is not letting up, even though Joe Biden is up in the polls by double digits, is not stopping the contact, you know, uh, the, the texting, the calling the literature dropping when possible, the socially distanced contact in a sense, it has to not only men lagging in response to what Latinas are saying about their polls and their willingness to, to go vote. I'm, I'm gonna give you the, 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 the line of kind of the poli sci official line, which is it's a truism that women over the last four decades have been outvoting their male counterparts. We just have been voting a lot more. And you know, we made up for lost time since the 19th Amendment was only passed 100 years ago and the VRA was passed 55 years ago. Uh, but we see just more of a habit of engagement in voting by women. I mean, I different interpretations, but you could also say that this campaign in this moment of COVID where women have been disproportionately affected as I was just speaking about earlier because of our job loss, and because of the loss of childcare and our kids having to do virtual learning. I think that also pulls at women more and gets them further mobilized to vote in addition to just that baseline data point that women vote more than men. Uh, Christina? I I don't have anything to add to what Victoria said. I think that she she got it one hundred percent right. <laughs> Great. 
Uh, so we have another question here from Paloma Diaz Lobos. Um, so who asks um, whether Trump's um, dancing performance about um, if he's, I guess the essence of the question is whether his sort of macho attitudes, his macho behavior, um, if that plays a role in uh, his appeal to uh, Latino males. So I would just say that if we look at uh, ethnic groups, again, uh, especially between the white and the Latino vote, that men and women uh, tend to vote more, women tend to vote more for Democrats and progressive candidates than, than men do. So I think I always push back on the narrative that Latino men are more machista um, because I think most societies and cultures are. <laughs> um, and we get unfairly pinned as ultra machista. Look, I spent 10 years organizing uh, an industry that was 96% Latino men, <laughs> the construction industry. And I have never felt as supported in my leadership as I did when I led that organization. And anything else I've done, those working class immigrant men, Latino men, supported me and believed I could do anything, if not better than a man could. Um, so I don't think the data really shows that Latino men tend to be, at least in their voting, more machista than any other ethnic group. I just think that this is a cultural norm that exists with most ethnic groups and most societies besides great matriarchal societies that exist. <laughs> Victoria? Amen. <laughs> um, so another question we have from uh, Stephen Justice is about, is pointing out that he says, hasn't the Pope himself criticized Trump's policies and will that make a difference uh, in elections? Start with you, Victoria. You know, back to the, to the abortion discussion, Raul, I think if you're already predisposed to vote based on what your religion dictates, then you're gonna vote that way. I don't think necessarily, I mean, if you're all, you know, Pope Francis is, I, I identify him with the social justice wing of, of the Democratic Party, of, of, of the Catholic faith. So I think that if you're already kind of in that social justice wing, you know, what Pope Francis is saying rings true. And if you're not in the social justice wing of the Catholic, Faith, then what Pope Francis says just kind of ticks you off and makes you vote the other direction. So I don't think it persuades one way or the other. I think it just further helps to solidify pre-existing attitudes, right? So it's like, oh, I'm, I'm a social justice Pope Francis type of Catholic, which I am, you know, knowing that the Pope is, is in line with, you know, having more open, more humane immigration just speaks to me and and, and further pumps me up. So I, I don't think it's a game changer. I think it's it's a little bit of a boost mobilizer. Christina, do you have something to add? Um, no, I, think I don't have anything to add to what Victoria said. Okay. Uh, another question we have from Chris Benovich. Uh, he asks, why do we only care about the youth vote once they turn 18? And what is Texas doing to mobilize youth such that they want to vote when they come of age? Why don't we start with uh, Christina? Um, so I think Texas does very little to mobilize the Latino youth vote. Um, and that is by design and with full intention. Um, you know, there is a statewide law that every high school twice a year should offer the opportunity to its senior class to, to register to vote. Um, you know, there was a recent study by Texas Civil Rights Project that found that the vast majority of high schools and school districts are not doing this in Texas. There is no uh, implementation tool um, and the Texas Secretary of State has been pretty happy to let that be. Um, I think what's really important at is that we are guided by some core principles. One, it should be easy and accessible for every single American to vote that if you are born in this country, you are born with and should die with the right to vote, that we should never take away people's right to vote. And if we are guided by those principles and hold both parties accountable to implementing policies with those values, that that's how we'll get greater support um, and investment in making sure that every single American, especially younger voters, are brought into the political process. Victoria? So just briefly, and, and here wearing my my 
civic engagement have. Uh, it's it's really saddening that not just among the Latino community, but in, in the white and the black communities, in our youth communities, we don't see civic engagement. We don't see that focus that my, my dad, who's in his 80s, there was more of a focus on civic studies, on civic engagement. We've lost that. It's no longer a core part of our studies. So I think that it's important to have organizations um, such, you know, shameless plug at the LBJ School, the Annette Strauss Institute across the way, different organizations in our communities that work with folks from a young age to help them understand what policy is, how they can be informed before they turn 18, because I completely agree, agree with Chris. She's absolutely right. We need to provide that toolkit so it's not like, oh, okay, suddenly you're 18, go vote. Well, why? Why should I vote if I haven't had anything in my base to instruct me why this matters and how to make an informed vote in addition to that? You're muted, Ro. Oh. Thank you both very much. We are out of time. I learned a tremendous amount uh, this evening. I'm sure uh, the rest of the audience did as well. Uh, so I thank you uh, very much for, for participating in this event. And I look forward to seeing and hearing from both of you again in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.